Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. It's an honor to have two wonderful poets with us today, Ellen Bass and Michelle Bidding. Michelle Bidding was shortlisted for the 2020 Montreal International Poetry Prize and a finalist for Radar Poetry's 2021 Coniston and Reed Magazine's 2020 Edwin Markham Prizes. A fourth collection of poetry, Broken Kingdom, won the 2018 Catamaran Prize and was named to Kirkus Review's Best of 2018. In 2021, her manuscript, Nightmares and Miracles, won the Wilder Prize and will be published by Two Sylvia's Press in 2022. She has had poems published in the new, in the American Poetry Review, the Los Angeles Review, Tupelo Quarterly, among others. Michelle is a lecturer in poetry and creative writing at Loyola Marymount University. Michelle Bidding's poetry is vivid, imaginative, exhilarating, vulnerable. She takes us into intimate places, not only of the body, but of the heart. A superb poet, Michelle Bidding. Thank you so much, Harry. What a beautiful introduction. And it's wonderful to be here with everybody. And Jennifer, thank you for making this happen. Um, and it's such a uh, an honor to be reading with Ellen Bass as well. Um, so I'm going to read a little medley of poems from my five collections and in chronological order. Um, the fifth one, Nightmares and Miracles, um, is due out in April um, of this year um, from Two Sylvia's Press. And um, this is a poem titled Trees, and it's the first poem in my first collection, Good Friday Kiss. Trees. My mother worries about trees in my yard, eucalyptus, their overgrown heads, how a bold October wind could roll the leaf heavy blankets down to smother us, curled in our sleep. She's minus a sun already, so statistics on falling trees are meaningless. She moves a beat ahead of doom's grim boot. Men arrive with ropes and saws. A whisper chipper settles in, blocks half the driveway. As the first sweeps of lopped green drop from the sky, slapping the startled lawn, I can't help but think of my brother, his long, beautiful hair, honey brown in summer, falling across tanned cheeks, every girl in school longed to taste, an athlete's torso they dreamed of exercising. When he died, I drove with my parents to the stuffy Tudor on Montana Avenue, where he became a box of dust, soft and gray as rabbit ears. The stiff man in pinstripes handed my father a sack. The clothes your son was wearing, he said, apologizing. Steering home, we pulled over to review the balled up t-shirt, sweatpants, underwear, suicide rags, his great escape suit. And it was then, seeing how little was left, bringing my brother home in a paper bag, I saw my father lurch, topple forward, his heart tumbling down, catching ours with the crush of it. And I knew there was no point in scurrying or calling for help. We could never get out of the way. Considering this is an event for the Motion Pictures and Television Fund, um, I felt um, a need to read this poem from my second collection uh, titled Notes to the Beloved. It's about my great grandmother, Beryl Mercer, a London and New York City stage and later screen actress who made many silent and talking films before she passed away in Santa Monica in 1939. This is about Beryl Mercer, actress. Time was you could stroll down Hollywood Boulevard and catch great grandma's name flaming every cherry marquee. In all quiet on the Western front, 
Cagney's long-suffering mom in The Public Enemy, she made the melancholy matriarch with her ocean liner hips and squat size, made the big brown spigots of her eyes open over a son gone to war or the devil. What fans didn't know, how close she lived each sorrow-filled part. Behind Musso and Frank Grill, trouble rising up the walls of her deco loft, the child lost to polio before his 12th birthday, the low talent husband who drank and threw her money at willing starlets, the illness that took her early with so many roles to spare. Now here on Sunset Boulevard, just shy of the gem blue Pacific, I roar past a bank gas station, Starbucks, the same plot of land she got conned into trading for a Texas font of tea that like so much else went dry. I'm thinking of her drooped jowls and mouth, dark hollows below the eyes, her glum faraway look belying a life of presumed glamour, Features my own face mimics gloomy days when I can be caught speeding across town. Windows wide, a dry Santa Ana spiriting me to the Musso and Frank bar. Dark paneled haunt of Faulkner, Chaplin, Fairbanks, and maybe Beryl, who floats in on her gossamer wings, finds a stool, a dry martini next to mine, and leaning into the microphone of her skewered olive, tells me how it really was, just how thirsty a girl could get. Um, I'm going to read the first poem in my book titled The Couple Who Fell to Earth, and this poem is for my husband, the fabulous actor Phil Abrams. The Couple Who Fell to Earth. We went flying without a map, as naked astronauts often do. The borders of our bodies blended into one, an erosion of planets and vaporized stars. We hurtled through space and burned up entering. Please forgive this clumsy beauty, no more than grains of dust, moon debris, a streak of light. We land and make a circle, a cornucopia in the crop, and the heat of our hips bores down, carving a cradle, the perilous pit, the stone fruit heart of human fire. The body loves what it loves and we can't stop it. We become an O around. We become the snake itself, the Rosetta coil, the upper room. We are flag and stigmata, the ship set sail, the smoking orifice, the holy divot and buried cup. Lips to each other's eyes, we will seal our demons in, the flowering trees and muddy gardens of our Eden scorched mouths. Crowns tossed to the breeze, the honeycomb bleeding gold and queen's poison darts. We have watched the fountain grass, felt their glowing spines shoot through us. The mournful wheat heads made of glass trace a cross on the cistern tomb. And to think we slept through it all, though the dream kept smacking us with every surge of the sea's cold blade. We are the lion and the lamb, the tooth in the flesh, flaming halo and silken curl, the wounded bird and coming ecstasy, this kingdom we've built, this kingdom until death parts us. This is a poem um, from uh, my book, Broken Kingdom, and it's about fishing with my father a long time ago in a faraway land. It's called An Hour North of Levining, California. Who remembers where we stopped for jars of orange neon cheese and the tangled black knots of faux flies my father taught me to thread, hooks that pierce the lips of bright trout skimming lagoons in the craggy Sierras. 
I remember ghost lines cast to blue nothingness. We watched dissolve in the lake's dark bottom. What did we say to each other, side by side, swaying in the wooden dish? Or was it just the music of the wind in trees parting ash white branches, the aspen banter? Why don't I remember reeling with the rush of my glittering first catch, the zagging colors cinched? I think it's come to the moment he showed me how to haul a fat fish up, how to grasp it tight in my girlish hand, the wriggling slickness releasing life on my nervous palm as I raised it high above me and in one grand swoop brought the stunned head down against our boat's iron edge. A gavel felled, a verdict delivered, stunning those wide round eyes to stillness. I can be as cruel as you, I wanted to say with pride, but didn't and still don't. It's enough to think of it now, enough to toss it back, to let that ugly beauty go. Um, these last poems are from my book, Nightmares and Miracles, that will arrive in April of this year. And this is a um, poem called Picking Berries, Bellevue, 1975. Praise to the summers spent whacking paths through blackberry bushes and to our mothers who knew just how much sugar and pectin to swivel in, just how long to let the violet pots bubble and swirl while they tossed back tanqueray and limes under an evergreen canopy. Mom and bestie Susie from Seattle tucked into the spruce dotted deck, late sun slipping away like a child with stolen pantry cake through back door screens, light sucking its stomach in, making itself a skinny ribbon, an echo without a blink. Our mothers sipping their tart icy drinks while we foraged, gossip, and you'll never believe what happened, gasped into the last rays casting shade over redwood slats and stripes across their swim-suited chest, rendering them zoo creatures or inmates, cages or heaven. It's hard to say, caught as they were in that epic's crosshairs, shades of June cleaver fading under Steinem's bold new strokes, frosty points of their pink toes tapping code against the deck's dark grain, their stifled bursts, laughter or low moans over a husband's secret deals, affairs, clients gone awry, the leaked lives, domestic baggage unleashed like exotic lap animals between them as cold gin greased vocal strings and volumes rose, signal to us on our return of their liquor compromised state and therefore freedom to do as we pleased after we dumped our brimming pails, bound left to ruddy immaculate kitchen sinks, sprinting then through shushing sprinklers to rinse dirt and brambles off, cooling ourselves in the high August heat. Our quest completed. One summer, my ersatz cousin Karen came running to where our mothers still reclined, savoring twilight cocktails while dinner's chicken pot pies bronzed on indoor racks. A scarlet band worming its way down Karen's leg as she ran, staining daisied bikini bottoms. I'm bleeding, and we thought maybe a rabid bush, berry prick, the tooth of a straggler vine catching her thighs soft underside and our rush to straddle thorns and snag the inky clumps, little brain-shaped bursts we'd fill our mouths and baskets with, ravenous for the dark marbles, their juicy explosions, like the city's far-off glimmer, its roiling magical bay. We'd leapt like ponies back to where our mothers cackled on, and now here was Karen doing a little plie, displaying the red rivulets, eyes lowered, overwhelmed, I thought she and I might be sick for a second, excitement and dread for my cousin's first period while our inmate mothers leaned in to 
Oh, and ah, and grin big at Karen, stroking her rookie cheeks, slurping the dregs of perspiring highballs as furies of forest leaves rustled, circling us in the dusk breeze. And we moved inside to help Karen clean up past the bubbling obsidian pots, dipping our pinkies in that Stygian sugary goo, best you ever tasted, sticky and sweet like the news of a daughter's menses we jar and seal under layers of thick wax long before the fathers came home. Um, just have two more poems. This is a little poem for my, 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 little, my, um, my family, my, my kids who are big kids now, um, young adults and my husband. It's called The Womb repaired. Without our doing anything, the fruit tree dropped its meat in sweet and fluid stanzas, bells landing in the bright bullseyes of our hands. Fancy that with all the bones going to rot, the house a witchy broth of stripped hinges and crooked door frames, like torn pages of a too beloved book, its haunted rooms, dun flowers and dark scuffs, floors marked to a dull unfinish. And still the oranges bearing oceans in a garden overthrown by rebel desert fauna. Still my love and I nodding off in the afternoon while the children become adults in the space of an hour. While the dog howls at a siren screaming down dawn, down the fucked up street we slumber on. Our dreams more delicious dissolve than savvy urban planning. More iron trickled through loam, seed coats split, igniting the radical. Dream coiled in clouds that flow and part as we lounge around waiting for the Simpsons to start. After all, it's Sunday. This last poem is for my parents, um, and it was inspired by a strange convergence of um, events not too long ago, as well as the marvelous um, essay, Joy, by Zadie Smith. And it's called Taken by Joy. It is not static, not one thing alone. We came for the Aspens, Lake, the stars, and immersed our bodies in its scumbled eye. The crater's blue slap, the needled scepters of pine, a protection spell surrounding us, and the darkness swirling about our ankles and above our heads we raise to the night, hoping to be showered with dust from the Pleiades, unafraid of the cold pearl, the sting of leaves hosting secrets and our skulls, ghost canyons and trails that somehow always lead home when the telephone rings and I hear here my father has leaned back far into his chair of distressed leather as we too were gazing at the wicked electromagnetic shooting out from nowhere, zapping the ridges of the brain like a sudden storm of split constellations, dead memories and drink. So hard was this coming meteor, he bit his tongue nearly off and lapsed into a shadow of himself where my mother found him running in to the breathless rattle, his head jolted back and tilted on its axis, mouth agape and quietly gasping as she pressed her open O to his and joined their planets for a moment, crossing, collapsing into a sputtering vacuum of violent seconds, lunar hours, galactic decades sucked and stalling, expanding and contracting like a nova to a nebula of red alarm, a blinding point of unstable giants, oxygen and gas, the anointing molecules, a cross of ash and chrism of lips I can press to my forehead now imagining it. And isn't that a kind of joy when you hold it to your mind like that? That sad, beautiful star falling through the universe, flashing before it dies, bright smoke that once spit you, human, 
from its convoluted core and lit a torch to the future like lovers rapturing do, licking the lap of death flaming oblivion with burst light, a final streak, a slash of seed against the black before they disappear completely. Thank you for such a lovely, smooth, even reading, to use one of your last words, joy. And I love the way you include the natural world. I also love the way that you put the body into the poem that poem of yours, The Couple Who Fell to Earth. I love that movie. And also, you not only put the body into the poem, which I love, uh, women and, and uh, gay people have been doing that for a few years, and I, I like that. Uh, and also, it, you transcend that. You transcend the body with the, your wonderful use of language. So thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Before we bring on Ellen, I. I just want to ask you one question, uh, if you could answer briefly. When did you write your first poem? Mm, um, I wrote my first poem um, because I went to take a class. I knew I needed to start writing. My brother had committed suicide, and um, uh, I was a I was um, a young bear, a, young, a mother of. Um, I had a baby, and everything was, you know, as it does, kind of crashing, and opening. And I went to take a class at UCLA um, and I thought I was in a short prose writing class and I was in a poetry writing class. But actually that's not the first time. I, I did write in, in, in at UC Berkeley in college. I was very much um, enamored of, I, I, I fell in love with Lorca and um, Dylan Thomas. And then later um, I came back around, but that's it, yeah. Thank you for reading. And uh, I will introduce Ellen. And Ellen Bass's most recent book is Indigo, Copper Canyon Press, 2020. She co-edited the first major anthology of women's poetry, No More Masks, Double Day, 1973, and co-wrote the groundbreaking The Courage to Heal, Harper Collins, 1988-2008. Her awards include fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the NEA, California Arts Council, three Pushcart Prizes, and the Lambda Literary Award. Her poems frequently appear in The New Yorker and many other magazines. A chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, Bass founded poetry workshops at Salinas Valley State Prison and Santa Cruz, California jails, and teaches in the MFA program at Pacific University. Ellen Bass's poetry contains vibrancy, narrative strength, and a sense of wonder that helps us see things anew. She has an exceptional use of language. There's also a comfort in her poems, even when facing the hard realities of life. Here's a brilliant poet, Ellen Bass. Thank you so much, Harry. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Oh, good. And Michelle, that was such a, that was an inspiring reading. Really, really wonderful. Gorgeous. Uh, so glad to hear it. And thank you all for putting up with my technical difficulties. Um, it's been quite a few weeks around here. We've had a biting insect invasion that I won't go into the details of. And then last night, water spilled on my laptop. So it's not with me right now. And uh, that made me want to start with this poem that is called Relax. Sometimes you know you write a poem from a place where you are uh, a little bit more wise than you are in your ordinary life. And then the, you have to read the poem again to remind yourself that there was a moment when you understood what it is that you wrote. So this is called Relax. Bad things are going to happen. Your tomatoes will grow a fungus and your cat will get run over. Someone will leave the bag with the ice cream melting in the car and throw your blue cashmere sweater in the dryer. Your husband will sleep with a girl your daughter's age, her breasts spilling out of her blouse. Or your wife will remember she's a lesbian and leave you for the woman next door. The other cat 
the one you never really liked, will contract a disease that requires you to pry open its feverish mouth every four hours. Your parents will die. No matter how many vitamins you take, how much Pilates, you'll lose your keys, your hair, and your memory. If your daughter doesn't plug her heart into every live socket she passes, you'll come home to find your son has emptied the refrigerator, dragged it to the curb, and called the used appliance store for a pickup, drug money. The Buddha tells a story of a woman chased by a tiger. When she comes to a cliff, she sees a sturdy vine and climbs halfway down. But there's also a tiger below, and two mice, one white, one black, scurry out and begin to gnaw at the vine. At this point, she notices a wild strawberry growing from a crevice. She looks up, down, at the mice, then she eats the strawberry. So here's the view, the breeze, the pulse in your throat. Your wallet will be stolen. You'll get fat. Slip on the bathroom tiles in a foreign hotel and crack your hip. You'll be lonely. Oh, taste how sweet and tart the red juice is. How the tiny seeds crunch between your teeth. I'm going to read some poems from my more recent book, um, Indigo, and this is called Sous Chef. I like cutting the cucumber, the knife slicing the darkness into almost transparent moons, each with its own thin rim of night. I like smashing the garlic with the flat of steel and peeling the sticky papery skin from the clove. Tell me what to do. I'm free of will. I carve the lamb into one-inch cubes. I don't use a ruler, but I'd be happy to. Give me a tomato bright as a parrot. Give me peaches like burning clouds. I'll pair those globes until dawn. The syrup will linger on my fingers like your scent. Let me escape my own insistence. I am the bee feeding the queen. Show me how you want the tart glazed. I still have opinions but I don't believe in them. Let me fillet the supple bones from the fish. Let me pit the cherries, husk the corn. You say how much cinnamon to spice the stew. I've made bad decisions, so I'm grateful for this yoke lowered onto my shoulders, potatoes mounded before me. With all that's destroyed, look how the world still yields a golden pear, freckled and floral, a shimmering marvel. It rests in my palm so heavily, perfectly. Somewhere there is hunger, somewhere fear. But here the chopping block is solid, my blade sharp. This next poem uh, is called The Small Country. I got interested in words that are difficult or almost impossible to translate from one language to another. And that was the genesis of how this poem began, the small country. Unique, I think, is the Scottish tartle, that hesitation when introducing someone whose name you've forgotten. And what could capture Cafune, the Brazilian Portuguese way to say, running your fingers tenderly through someone's hair? Is there a term in any tongue for choosing to be happy? And where is speech for the block of ice we pack in the sawdust of our hearts? What appellation approaches the smell of apricots thickening the air when you boil jam in early summer? What words reach the way I touched you last night, as though I had never known a woman, an explorer, wholly curious to discover each particular fold and hollow, without guide, not even the mirror of my own body. Last night, you told me you liked my eyebrows. You said you never really noticed them before. What is the word that fuses this freshness with the pity of having missed it? And how even touch itself cannot mean the same to both of us, even in this small country of our bed even in this language, with only two native speakers. The 
this next poem um, arose from an experience when I was uh, teaching poetry at Salinas Valley State Prison, and it was spring. It was so beautiful. I live in Santa Cruz, and it just seemed like roses and flowers were blooming all over the city, and it's so gray, and nothing is growing inside the prison, and so I had this idea of bringing in flowers, and this is the poem that resulted, bringing flowers to Salinas Valley State Prison. When Mr. H saw the little meadow blooming on the steel table, he bowed to the starry faces of jasmine. This is the first flower I've smelled in 20 years. And when I slid each man a bouquet in a paper cup, Mr. M said, I'll have such a short time with these. We spoke then about beauty and loss, the great themes of poetry. And when our time was done and the guards said they had to leave the flowers, most of the men acquiesced. But Mr. S insisted he had, as a Native American, a right to his rituals, sage, sweet corn, tobacco, and no one could stop him, it was the law, from taking these sacred plants back to his cell. Then he raised his cup and drank the water the flowers were drinking, and a small wind stirred in that windowless room. As we watched Mr. S quietly bite the heads off the Peruvian lilies, crushing their pink sepals and the gold inner petals flecked with maroon, swallowing the silvery filaments, their dark pollen-laden anthers, his mouth frothing with blossoms. A triumph, a triumph of ingenuity. This is a poem that I wrote when my beloved dog Zeke was very close to uh, dying, and it's called Ode to Zeke. O oh, breathing drum, O oh, cask of dark waters, O oh, decaying star, my barking heart, my breaking brother, what will seep into the space your body leaves? O oh, huge 18 muscled ears, Oscillating ossicles and cochlea, your busy canals, now hollow caves of quiet. I have said your fur is black, but you are silvered, rhymed with frost. You are the new moon, you are light in the dark house. How long will I see your shadow? O oh, heavy hunk of existence, O oh, great flank, I have rested my head upon when I was too weak for human touch. Sleek leading man, you debonair dog. How people on the avenue stopped to swoon. Oh, splaying legs once faster than rabbits, canines slashing flesh, urgent thug, unstoppable thrust. Oh, happy snapping at the wind. What do you remember now that you are mudslide, glacier melting, cliff collapsing into the sea? I have memorized your milky breath your ballet leaps and whirligigging, your princely patience as the children dressed you, soccer, Zeke, in jersey and shorts, one paw on the ball, snorkel, Zeke, with mask and fins, bar mitzvah, Zeke, and a yarmulke, and my father's silk talit. Oh, my text of decrepitude, my usher to death, companion of 10,000 years, I'll fry you a fish, I'll sit by your bowl, eat from my hand. I have nowhere to go. This poem um, arose, this next poem arose, I was part of a uh, project called New Voices, Contemporary Poets and uh, Writers Confronting the Holocaust. And we were, we were given 
each of us were, was given an image to respond to. And usually I find I can't really do anything when I'm asked to write a particular poem. Um, I'm kind of at the mercy of the poems that uh, are willing to kind of give themselves up to me. And so I, I was worried about this, but then I looked at the image that was given to me and I did feel an immediate connection and was able to write this poem. So it's called Photograph. And then uh, the title of the photograph is Jews Probably Arriving to the Woods Ghetto, circa 1941 to 1942. Why is a horse here alongside the train? Two horses yoked with leather harnesses, light silvering their flanks in the midst of the Jews descending. Where is the driver taking the cart, loaded with wooden planks? What is in the satchel that weighs down the arm of a woman in a dark coat, her hair parted on one side? A woman I could mistake for my mother in the family album, only my mother was in Philadelphia selling milk and eggs and penny candy because her mother escaped the pogroms, a small girl in steerage crying for her mother. What are the tight knots of people saying to one another? A star burns the right shoulder blade of each man, each woman. Light strikes each shorn neck and caps each skull. No one is yet stripped of all but a pail or a tin to drink from and piss in. Dread like sun sears the air and breaks over the planes of their faces. Light clatters down upon them like stones, but we can't hear it. Nor can we hear blood thud under their ribs. They will be led into the ghetto and then we'll be led out to the camps. But for now, the eternal now, the light is silent. Silent the shadows in the folds of their coats. The bones of the horses are almost visible. Their nostrils are deep, soft shadows. And the woman, who could be, but is not my mother, still carries her canvas bag. And, looking closer, what might be, a small purse. I had um, the good fortune to have a week in um, the Andrews Experimental Forest in Southern Oregon. They have a, a wonderful program there where uh, scientists are studying the forest in um, long studies of, they expect to go on for 200 years, which is one of the most optimistic things I uh, know about. And um, they are very enlightened. They believe that writers and artists should be in conversation with scientists. So they have residencies for uh, writers and artists, and, and I was there for a week and I wrote this poem. It's called Fungus on Fallen Alder at Lookout Creek. Florid, fluted, flowery petal, flounce of a girl's dress, ruffled fan, striped in what seems to my simple eye an excess of extravagance. Intricately ribboned like a secret code, a colorist's vision of DNA. At the outermost edge, a scallop of ivory, then a tweedy russet, then mouse gray, a crescent of celadon velvet, a streak of sleek seal brown, a dark arc of copper, then butter, then celadon again, again butter, again copper, and on into the center, striped thinner and thinner to the green, green moss furry heart. How can this be necessary. Yet it grows and is making more of itself. Dozens and dozens of tiny stars, stars no bigger than a baby's thumbnail, all of them sucking one young dead tree on a gravel bank that will be washed away in the next flooding winter. But isn't the air here cool and wet? 
and almost unbearably sweet. This next poem is the uh, title poem of my book, Indigo, and it is called Indigo. As I'm walking on West Cliff Drive, a man runs toward me, pushing one of those jogging strollers with shock absorbers so the baby can keep sleeping, which this baby is. I can just get a glimpse of its almost translucent eyelids. The father is young, a jungle of indigo and carnelian, tattooed from knuckle to jaw, leafy vines and blossoms, saints and symbols. Thick wooden plugs pierce his lobes, and his sunglasses testify to the radiance haloed around him. I'm so jealous, as I often am. It's a kind of obsession. I want him to have been my child's father. I want to have married a man who wanted to be in a body, who wanted to live in it so much that he marked it up like a book, underlining, highlighting, writing in the margins, I was here. Not like my dead ex-husband, who was always fighting against the flesh, who sat for hours on his zafu, chanting Om, and then went out and broke his hand, punching the car. I imagine when this galloping man gets home, he's going to want to have sex with his wife who slept in late, and then he'll eat barbecued ribs and let the baby teeth on a bone while he drinks a dark beer. I can't stop wishing my daughter had had a father like that. I can't stop wishing I'd had that life. Oh, I know, it's a miracle to have a life, any life at all. It took eight years for my parents to conceive me. First, there was the war, and then just waiting and my mother's bones so narrow, she had to be slit and I airlifted. That anyone is born, each precarious success from sperm and egg to zygote embryo infant is a wonder. And here I am alive, almost 70 years and nothing has killed me. Not the car I totaled running a stop sign or the spirochete that screwed into my blood. Not the tree that fell in the forest exactly where I was standing my best friend shoving me backward so I fell on my ass as it crashed. I'm alive, and I gave birth to a child, so she didn't get a father who'd sling her onto his shoulder, and so much else she didn't get. I've cried most of my life over that, and now there's everything that we can't talk about. We love but cannot take too much of each other. Yet she is the one who, when I asked her to kill me, if I no longer had my mind, we were on our way into Ross shopping for dresses. That's something she likes, and they all look adorable on her. She's the only one who didn't hesitate or refuse or waver or flinch. As we strode across the parking lot, she said, okay, but when's the cutoff? That's what I need to know. And I'll end with this poem. Any common desolation can be enough to make you look up at the yellowed leaves of the apple tree, the few that survived the rains and frost shot with late afternoon sun. They glow a deep orange gold against a blue so sheer a single bird would rip it like silk. You may have to break your heart, but it isn't nothing to know even one moment alive the sound of an oar in an oarlock, or a ruminant animal tearing grass, the smell of grated ginger, the ruby neon of the liquor store sign, warm socks. You remember your mother, her precision a ceremony, as she gathered the white cotton, slipped it over your toes, drew up the heel, turned the cuff. A breath can uncoil as you walk across your own muddy yard, the Big Dipper pouring night down over you, and everything you dread, all you can't bear, dissolves, and like a needle slipped into your vein, that sudden rush of the world. What a great poetry reading, Ella. 
the poetry reading that you gave was sagacious, mindful, relaxing. You know, I use the word comfort in my intro. And I think one of the reasons there's such comfort in your writing or hearing your writing is that you're such a masterful writer and you have such a great range. And also it's it's um it's timeless and it's transfixing. And you know, you that you had one phrase, stars no bigger than a baby's thumbnail. And years ago, Ann Stanford, my teacher, she used a phrase, a star as big as a watermelon. And you see the small and the large. And uh it's all it's just all so human that just uh it it's one of those poetry readings that could go on. I mean, I could listen to you two forever. Uh, just uh, such a uplifting time out of time experience. So um, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, Ellen, when did you write your first poem? I wrote my first poem uh, I, because uh, you asked Michelle. I knew that you were going to ask me, so I, I was remembering back. Uh, I was in junior high, and the the girls that I was friends with, um, you know, had a kind of clique, cliqueish thing going on, and they rejected me, and I was very, very sad and um, miserable for a while. And I wrote this poem, and I remember that there was one line in it: "They know not what they do." <laughs> <laughs> What is it about the poetry form, Ellen, that attracts you to it? Oh gosh, it's really, um, it's really to help me live. It's it's to um, allow me to see my life and life that our our shared life um, in um, in a perspective that. By you know, by kind of um, slowing down and really paying attention to life, to my life, to our shared life, to uh, what's going on in the world, what's going on inside me, and to be able to pay attention to that so that it doesn't uh, slip by without me noticing, and so that I can uh, talk to myself about it and gra- grapple with it you know just like that first poem you know relax i mean those are those are operating instructions and i don't i'm not really a relaxed person so i have to i have to talk to myself and um it, it, it you know it, i think that it is for all of us who write some way of making order out of chaos and making the unbearable bearable and you know, working toward that place of acceptance that uh, is just uh, for myself uh, very difficult. Very surrender is very difficult. You know, I want to, I want to control things, and um, you know, and when when I'm writing a poem, I don't, I, I only have a certain amount of control, and uh, the rest is, uh, you know. Up to uh, up to forces that aren't the kind of forces that are in my everyday life. Well, I see that uh, mindfulness in that when you were talking about preparing food, and that was very relaxing. And uh, I will ask Michelle the same second question that I asked Ellen: What attracts you to the poetry form, Michelle? Well, um, just following on what Ellen said, um, the relief, you know, relief, release from the the weight and the fire and the the um, the the tension of life to to, again, you know, keep reconnecting with something that's that goes beyond all of that, because it is a, a outrageous you know being able to be alive and being able to um the the preciousness of that all the rest nothing else matters we're gonna die you know so and i just the the that that um that preciousness and that um 
the 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 treasure like i was thinking of ellen's the, the how she was able to slow the poem down and take us through that moment of putting the the sock on her foot mm-hmm. her mother putting the sock on her foot and i went wow you know she just slowed the whole thing and we're right there and it's like what what the freak else is there you know <laughs> and so always looking for those um art and and poetry and film and plays and you know those those uh those moments where the image it is really like the vortex that is just opens and connects with you know with with all things and the the rhythm and the um the life force and nothing else matters and whether we're taking a small thing like cutting up a vegetable or even dealing with you know, a large thing that's difficult to comprehend the Holocaust and the tragedy of that. And yes. and that's another thing I loved about your poetry, Ellen, was your compassion. You know, it just, uh, you know, we go through a lot of life. We could talk about life, but, you know, just sticking with poetry, uh, <laughs> this has just been really an, uh, uh, an amazing poetry reading. Ellen and Michelle, you two are just fabulous poets. And I'm just thankful for you. It, it's an uplifting experience for me. It really exhilarates me. And, and uh, you know, we go through life and we get clobbered. And I remember years ago, I was doing an interview and somebody asked me, what have I learned and what lesson? I said, well, I sought wisdom and I learned humility. And uh, mm-hmm. Ellen used the word acceptance. And I think acceptance is a great word. And uh, especially, you know, I'm older than both of you and also moving toward death, the sense of acceptance from a if possible, a uh, sense of sorrowlessness, but a, a sense of thankfulness for, you know, what we have been able to have, all the good and the bad, and being able to challenge, channel that into poetry, which is quite a blessing. I think that's one of the reasons we learned the craft, too. So even if you're going through a lot of emotion, you can sit there and execute the words and the visions that come through you. So, you know, we could talk forever. You know, I could listen to both of you forever. So I want to thank you very much. And uh, Jennifer Clymer, before we leave, I'm sure you have something to say. I know how much you love poetry. Jennifer, you know, when COVID hit in March of at least uh, when it hit us, we stopped all activities and all gatherings. And Jennifer started doing Zoom shows four days a week. She, now she's down to three. And she asked me to do this poetry show. And this is our 89th one. And uh, MPTF, I know most of you know this, but it has a legacy of giving for over 100 years. And you two ladies, you two great poets have also, you know, given poetry. And I I thank you for your graciousness and your generosity. And here's Jennifer. I, um, I needed a moment to gather myself because I was in tears at the end. You're poem about your daughter's journey and how uh, you would have loved to have given her that type of a man as a as a father but it didn't make a difference at the end of the day she's she's the one who's like I got your back you you let me know what your parameters are and um, my mom had that journey with a family member um, Mm. and that's a really it was such an interesting way to go into what ultimately was, was a huge conversation of like, there's a sexy guy running a kid in a, in a stroller and I'm, I'm giving my daughter the right to pull the plug when it's time, like the gamut and the, beautiful, <laughs> you know, wandering path that you gave us to get there. It, it really touched me. Um, and Harry, this is the 89th show. I didn't realize that's crazy. And to know that next week we'll have 90 hours of poems, guests, songs, um, discussions, really thought provoking discussions. I have to thank you for, for stepping into the void this is a very, for the last two years, this has been such an unknown of what tomorrow will bring or 
I know I struggle at times with this feeling of, I have to keep generating hope. I have to keep the desire to move forward in this world alive in a different way until we can get back to a place where you don't have fear and anxiety blended with what should be a joyful social setting. And you stepped into that with such bravery and, and confidence, and you are a wonderful leader. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. You know, for me, what you were just talking about, it's that, uh, who was, you know, the guy, um, oh God, uh, Beckett, you know, he has that one line, I can't go on, I must go on. So, I mean, it's always that existential question. And, uh, you know, so thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Ellen and Michelle. Just, uh, you know, a sacred, if I may use the word, sacred reading. And thank you once again, Jennifer. My pleasure. We will see you back here next week. Um, Ellen, Michelle, thank you. It was truly, truly a pleasure. Well, thank you for all for making this possible. It's just great that you're doing this. It's just a pleasure to be here with you. And Michelle, so great to hear your poems. So it's wonderful, wonderful to, to read together. Mm-hmm.